to the Woodmere Beach School of the Bible, and I am not Pastor Ken. My name is Dave Naff, and we are going to do an overview of the book of Revelation tonight. So normally we will start with a psalm, but tonight we are going to do something a little different, and we're going to start reading in Matthew chapter 24. Okay, so let's start um, right from the beginning of the chapter. And Mary Claire, would you start and let's do about five verses each. Matthew 24. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. Verse 6. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all of these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. I can go. I can do it, but should I work on myself? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Go ahead and finish that. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. <clears throat> We're going to pick up again in just a minute, but this passage is almost a parallel to the bulk of the book of Revelation. It predicts what's going to happen after the end of the church age until um, second coming. And I'm going to pass out these little charts. And if you look on one side, you'll see the timeline of Matthew 24. And on the other side, you'll see the timeline of Revelation and how that's a parallel. And I couldn't really think of a better overview for Revelation than this chapter in Matthew. <clears throat> Chart timeline Matthew. 
you'll see where the midpoint of the tribulation is the abomination of desolation that Lisa just read. Pick up on. Um, let's see. Uh, 16 is where we left off. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to read 16 to 20. And then Mary Claire can pick up after that. I'm sorry, 17, 20. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one. <clears throat> In the field, go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Verse 21. There will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless the time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. Verse 26, if therefore they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Whenever the corpse, it, where, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will be see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves you know that summer is nigh so likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. <clears throat> Any thoughts on what we read so far? I have a question. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if I have, I have, a, answer, few, I have but... a few questions actually. But one is where it says, uh, "This generation shall not pass till these things be fulfilled." I don't quite, at first blush, understand that because, I mean, this was written Matthew. This was written back at the beginning of the church, and obviously, if it means generation like, like um, every thirty years. That generation has passed, so I don't quite get it. Well, the, the Lord, I guess a day is like a thousand years, so would that kind of explain it? That could be. Does anybody have a different word for generation? Mine says generation. Generation. Okay, mine has an alternative word, it's race. So, could be talking about mankind as it is on the earth today. <clears throat>
could be talking about the generation that is alive at the time all this starts. <clears throat> That's the mystery of Revelation, as we're going to find out over the next few weeks. <laughs> um, sometimes Jesus speaks in riddles. And uh, I think we often won't know what those are till they've passed. So, in other words, I don't have an answer. Well, no, that's honest. <coughs> I mean, that's honest. And I, There's many, a lot of speculations. A lot of things, in the, many things in the Bible are very clear, but a few are not as clear. <laughs> to me, I'm speaking anyway. Most, many things are, are, are crystal clear. But some are just um, look like a little curveball, but that doesn't mean it. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that that's. I've heard it said that's an area that you know you don't you don't get yet, and then at some point you know you, you will get probably get it. I mean, Pastor Kenneth said that God will reveal everything just as a question of at the right time. You know, so um, and we might not see it this side of heaven either. That's true. That's true. And that's think, okay too. That's okay too. I think we'll also find that. A lot of times the timing is purposely vague because it says no man will know. And actually when Jesus was here and um, this was the, from the Olivet Discourse, which I guess the pastor is going to preach on when he's done with parables, he didn't even know the time. Only the Father knew. It wasn't revealed to him till he went to heaven. As, so. I, as I read it back here again, um, the, the point is, it says, as you see these things, you know it's very near. It's close. It's right. at the doors. And then he says, this generation won't pass away until these things will fill. It, I mean, one meaning could be the church age. The, you know, because we're in the age of grace and the age of um, the Gentiles. And the, um, so it could be that. Well, we're definitely in the last of the last days, as I think we'll see more and more as we look in Revelation at the various signs to come. It'll be interesting to see how things shake out as to where everybody falls. Um, and yeah. right, right after it, where it says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So. The point being that this earth is going to be, you know, renovated and made new. But whatever these words are that he's telling us, they're they're going to happen. They're not going to just right. disappear. So, so we can always trust that if God said it, it's going to happen, even if we don't understand. So anyway, I thought that was a good capsule to mm -hmm. <clears throat> enter into Revelation with, and. Um, These are kind of just some facts and terms that we're going to encounter. And um, well, thank you, Peter. Okay. Thank you very much. So the book of Revelation is very unique in the Bible, other than a few passages here and there like we just read in Matthew and in Daniel. Um, it's the only book that's truly apocalyptic. So, a lot of things in there that we'll see are symbolic. And I've always wondered if John was taken into heaven to see all these things. Can you imagine someone from the first century seeing what's being dropped into the 21st century or seeing what's in the 21st century and trying to describe it with first century terms? And 
And I think that's a lot of what reason things seem funny and seem vague and it's like, well, that couldn't be. It's a, how could there be that kind of creature? Well, that was him trying to describe what he sees in our time with the knowledge of a first century person. Can you imagine someone seeing an airplane back then? Mm. Well, well, how would they describe that? How would you describe a tank rolling, you know, in battle and stuff? So I just always, I always found that interesting that a lot of the descriptions are not things that we see in our term. This come to John in a dream, though, didn't it? He was in the spirit. He was in the spirit. So I don't know. It's really hard to, yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know if physically he was yeah. taken up, but I know that at least spiritually, um, he was transported. Well, and he says he heard behind him the voice, and like many waters. Mm -hmm. And so he turns around and then he sees Christ. It says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So, I mean, it was like a vision, like real. And I believe it was King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> but he wasn't there. Um, but he said he was taken there. So whether his spirit was taken there or whatever, um, that's a mystery too. We don't know when they say they were. But I don't believe it was simply a dream. I think it was more than, more than that. I mean, John was close to 100 years old at this time. It's a lot to remember from a dream, too. Huh? And, well, the spirit, <laughs> like with, when he was Elisha, I think it was, he saw the, um, they were, he was in a building, and the, 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 all the fiery chariots of the Lord's hosts were around it, and he could see them. But his servant or whatever couldn't, so he said he asked that his eyes would be open so he could see them too. So, I mean, the spirit realm, not to be weird, but the spirit realm is real, but we don't really see it. Mm. I don't think Very we, often. Yeah, we don't experience it. Right. Mm. But it's there. So I said John was the author. Technically that's true, but John didn't write it. Mm. He's a messenger. Jesus wrote it. Yeah. He, he yeah, was just the, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting that when you look at the first chapter, we're not going to really go into it much, but uh, the first, what is it, the first? three verses, it's talking about John. It's not John. It refers to him in the third person. It's not till verse four that John is actually doing the writing. It's very, I, usually I kind of breeze over stuff like that because come on, let's hurry up and get to the meat of the story, right? But I mean, it says God gave this revelation to Jesus, and then, then Jesus, by a, an angel, his angel gives it to John, and then John writes the, to the to the churches, and he writes to angels. He addresses the angel of each church. So it's kind of there's a lot of nuance. That's what I found. There's a ton of nuance. I mean, I'm sure I don't have all, all of it, but it's very. Um, but like Pastor said, it's the revelation. It's not revelations. It's one revelation. Mm -hmm. And it's um it's a prophecy really. And and but Jesus was giving it. Um and one thing that well, the whole thing of giving it to angels, like when Mary got her story about being pregnant with Jesus, an angel gave her the information. Well here John is giving an angel information. So I just found this, it, but again, as Christ keeps going, it's, well, this is kind of the wrap up of the world, really, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the Bible, and this, this revelation is like, in a way, the wrap up of this, this uh, our existence as we know here, anyway. 
And it's, um, wow, I don't know. There's a lot to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I find there's a lot to get. <coughs> a little more of the background. John was probably in prison. It was probably an island. Uh, Patmos speculated was a penal colony. And it's really not that far from the physical location of the seven churches. It's just off the coast on a little island. <clears throat> and he was there because he was preaching the gospel. That's why he was exiled there. And correct me if I'm wrong, but John was the only apostle that was not martyred. That's what, I know. That's what I've always heard. Yeah. Yeah. So God preserved him for this writing. It says in either chapter one or two that he was it was for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. So that was his purpose in essence for being, you know, there. And obviously it, to me it seemed like the book of Revelation was his you know, crowning what he did, because I mean, he wrote John and he also wrote one, two, three John, but Revelation is just like. Was this one. was written many years after the other books he wrote. Um, it could, could have been written as early as 70 AD, but it likely was written <clears throat> 95 AD because there were two emperors, one in the mid 60s and one in the 90s that basically wanted emperor worship and they were persecuting the churches because of that. One was Nero, but there was another one, I can't remember mm -hmm. his name, but he's the one in the 90s. And um, that was one of the reasons of the writing to the different churches, because they were all undergoing persecution from this emperor who one his worship name, of him. Have his name here, Emperor Domitian. 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 I think it's Domitian or something. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that he's more. It's more likely it was then. Also, because of the everything in the book and the fact that John did die at close to a hundred, he likely did not write this thirty years before he died. So, I mean, nobody knows exactly when right. when all these were written, but that's likely it. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, you know, like John was a disciple Jesus loved, and he reclined with them at the table, and you know, and then when he sees the Lord, uh, when he when that when he's in the spirit and he turns around and he sees the Lord. He falls down at his feet like he's dead. <laughs> it just strikes me like, you know, the contrast of the Lord from when he was on earth with John and then now with this uh, revelation he's giving. It's just the contrast. And the Lord has the white hair. His eyes are like flames of fire. I can't imagine it. And he has a, a he's got, he's all Of course, you're getting way into chapter one. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, it just, the contrast is what struck me, the difference. And he had to put his hand <clears> on him and say, don't be afraid. Because he was terrified. Yeah, he fell mm -hmm. down like he was dead, mm -hmm. so. Now, I always knew there were lots of sevens in Revelation. Mm -hmm. But until I did the research, I didn't oh. realize there were 52 sevens. Wow. Mentioned in Revelation. So I only listed some of the more pertinent ones. But um, obviously, <coughs> the way I look at it, sorry about the cough, by the way. Revelation completes the Bible, it completes time. It completes the world as we know it. And seven is the number of completion. 
So it make, almost makes sense that there would be a lot of sevens. And they're not always good sevens. No. There's a lot of, a lot of sevens that uh, seven plagues. we don't want to be here for. <laughs> well, actually, it's seven and se it's seven and six and seven. Because the seventh one is the opening of the... Yeah, that's how they do it. They're all coupled into each other. Okay. Any comments on anything so far? Come on, guys, you gotta talk some. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was sat under teaching for two years, so we, oh. <laughs> you, you must have it down. <laughs> no. But um, is seven the number of completeness because it's in Revelation? Or is that, where is the completeness come from? It goes back to Genesis. It was, oh, okay. Oh, seven uh, seventh days. day. Yep. Oh, all right. In a week. Yeah. Got arrested. And, yeah. So right. it, it, it's throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's just very, very prevalent in uh, the book of Revelation. Well, it's kind of exciting to, to think of everything wrapping up, you know? Because life keeps going on and on. Mm -hmm. You have to have the patience of the saints, and, which is, you do, but to think of it actually, to, to, to grasp it will wrap up. Well, it wraps up, but it's just the beginning. Well, that'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be, that'll be awesome. That'll be very awesome. Okay. This next part gets, I don't know, maybe it's a little technical and stuff, but it's, <clears throat> there's four different ways you can interpret the book of Revelation. Um, so I'll just go through them. The preterists, as I believe is how it's pronounced, they believe that everything had already happened as of the time of the writing. Don't ask me how they could believe that, mm. reading it, but mm. I've actually got a book at home and it, it goes through Revelation with the four columns of different ways to interpret and shows how everybody interprets that section of Revelation based on that view. And it kind of makes some sense, but it really <clears throat> I don't I don't see how looking back two thousand years you can say that made sense. Um, next one is the historicists. And um, they believe that the everything that's described in Revelation takes place from the time it was written to the end of history. In other words, it's ongoing, not futuristic, not upcoming. So to get ahead of myself, the church age, mm -hmm. to a historicist, each of the seven churches is an age that's sequential through time. And we're supposedly on the last of the church age, which would be the seventh church and that's what they believe they believe that it's all ongoing Does that make sense so there's they're saying then that the first six churches mentioned have already have already happened passed. in order in order and the seventh church that's mentioned is, is likely where, where we are it. today yes okay. <clears throat> which if you read them it 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 really doesn't fit, but they make it fit. Okay. So, um, then there are futurists, and the futurist believes that everything is primarily in the end times. So they basically believe that not only are the description of the churches 
the physical church then, but it also is today. Those churches exist today, which you could, if you look at the description of the seven churches, which we'll get to in the next couple of weeks, almost every church and almost every person can fit one or more of them, the characteristics of the church. So, from that point of view, it makes sense. And then there are the idealists, which basically believe everything in Revelation is symbolic. And uh, it's just examples of timeless truths. It doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. So, when there's, uh, you know, when, when Satan's bound and thrown into the lake of fire, that's just good triumphing over evil. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not physically what's going to happen according to them. Now, are there different writers that fit every single one of these categories yeah. that have written books? Yeah. And in going through the books I have, it's funny, you can, you can pick it up almost right away uh, where they're coming from. Most, most writers are kind of a combination of uh, historicists and futurists. Um, idealists, I, I haven't really seen anything, any writings. <clears throat> but I can, <clears throat> I can imagine what, uh, how that would go, looking at a lot of the things in Revelation. And that's taken symbolism to a big extreme. And it kind of applies if you look at the, the views of the seven churches, I just threw that in there. Was that simply to the seven churches that existed? At the time, um, it obviously fit the way the church was. Um, or is it talking about the seven periods of history, like I just mm -hmm. mentioned? Um, are those messages to the churches today? Does, do churches fit one of those descriptions? Or is it simply a message to all Christians, where do you fit? And uh, I think it's a combination. And if, you, if you read every one of those bullet points, I think it, the reference to the seven churches is a combination of those. Oh, sorry. Those scenarios. Yeah, because a lot of scripture can thank you. Sure. A lot of scripture you can some, it can mean more than one thing. I'm not saying scripture just means everything, but like one time you can interpret it one way and another time it might uh, you might get another meaning too with it. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> So these are kind of capsules of the churches. Again, we're, we'll be talking about that probably after next week. I would think next week would be chapter one. And then I'm not really sure how he's going through mm -hmm. Revelation. Um, I know he likes to take more of the spiritual view of it than the, maybe the potential historical view yeah. of it. But uh, I don't see how a lot of it you can separate. Um, but anyway, you, you can see where you can take something from almost every one of the, the churches that are listed there. And some churches you can say that they, that's them. And Obviously, we want to be the churches that are commended, not the ones that are criticized. 
Notice Church of Laodicea is commended for nothing. Wow. And if you look at the church ages, seven consecutive periods, then that would be the seventh. And in many ways, that's the church today. Yeah. The church as a whole. Yeah, the church. Mm, yeah. yeah, collectively. Right. Not collectively, yeah. You know, yes, there are so churches. Many, that... So many parts of the world, like Europe. You know, nobody goes to church in, in Europe anymore. And here, in the, in the Northeast is the most unchurched mm -hmm. population in the in our country. So, and and people just keep falling more and more away, especially from when we were children. Uh, you know, it was expected that you went to church and you learned about Jesus and. That's not the case anymore. I believe it's 47% go to church on a semi-regular or regular basis. And uh, 30 years ago, it was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So. And for some positive information, um, our other church that we were at for about, I don't know, six, eight years, the, the pastor was from London and uh, shared about a real revival in that area. They had their two branches of the church were joining together and they had like 5,000 people worshiping and praising God. Um, and on Facebook, I have book groups that I post in, I put little, little verses and photos. And one of the groups I'm in is a guy, he calls himself former Sunni, blah, 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 Muslim, whatever he is. He, um, he, he was a former Sunni Muslim, and he, he has a group, and he posts un, just um, a lot of group shots of people that left, like, uh, it's either Iran or um, Iraq or both, or even other places, and they, they're being baptized. I mean, there's like 50, 100 people, um, a lot of uh, women re that have left Islam. So there's quite a few, it sounds like, I know in the news there were, um, you know, there was the protests mm -hmm. with that lady, and I guess she got killed. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But it sounds like there's a lot of also um, turning to Christ because they just see how awful it is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's some positive. <laughs> Thank God for that, right? Well, even I think world events, what's going on around us right now. I mean, just look what's happened in this country just in the last three weeks. You know, lots of tragic stuff, but in the background, I, the Lord is working, and there's there's purpose behind you know these tragic events. I I truly believe that that you know His hand is is in that. You mean the football player? Or what? Well, all the, the football player, the, all these mass shootings. Oh, that's um, awesome. You know, uh, there, there's a, uh, I just read another article in the paper today. A 39-year-old woman um, gave birth to her son on December 12th, and something tragic happened. She ended up in the ICU, and she passed away on December 31st. She held her baby twice, hmm. you know, in that, you know, in that period of time. Um, I don't think that's me. It's the phone. Should I get it? Is that a phone? No, it's not in there. No, I think it's my phone. Oh, I thought I had turned off my ring. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, now her husband is going to be, has a six-week-old son, and he's going to be raising him by himself. And, um, you know, so what, what? what's the purpose behind that? There's got to be some kind of purpose behind that. don't always know, but there's always, one thing I realized today is that God, God has a plan. Yeah. Um, sometimes in your own life, you, we, Dave and I were talking and he sh shared about a teaching position and then it changed and whatever, but I mean, every step where something doesn't happen that maybe you thought should or whatever, it takes you a certain direction and then your whole life goes that way because God has a plan. Because I guess we all, you know, you know, we're human, so.
can't always see mm -hmm. what that is or anything, but, but God does have a plan behind for all of us. Mm -hmm. and so, just learning to trust it. Mm -hmm. Trust Him. That's the hardest part. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> He's got a plan, but we have to learn to trust. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Just a few terms that I listed here <clears throat> that come up over and over again. And uh, may or may not be controversial depending on everybody's point of view. I know I already differ with Pastor Ken on a few things. <laughs> nothing nothing urgent, but we differ in some timing. Um, so the first thing is the rapture. You're not going to find the rapture in Revelation. The word. Or even the occurrence. It's, Ooh, okay. it's not there. Okay. Um, you have to look in Thessalonians to see the description of what the rapture is. You're not going to find the word rapture, I don't think. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, I don't believe. I've never actually the done it. Is, never, the, concept the concept is, I've concept never done a word search. Yeah, word. it's not. But, no, um, no it, it's inferred. And that's why it's, it's, there's so much discussion about where it falls. When are people taken up? Is it beginning, middle? We'll get to that in a minute. But the description of the rapture is actually in First Thessalonians. We can read it. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And verse 17 is really important there in interpreting a lot of what is in Revelation. <clears throat> it says, We who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. So that leads to the next item, which is the second coming of Christ. Christ will return the way he left. He left from the earth. He's going to return to the earth. Now, in my opinion, that is not when the rapture happens. Because Christ is physically going to come down and be on the earth. Yet, the rapture, if you read Thessalonians, is we're going to be caught up in the cloud to meet him. I don't believe Christ actually comes physically to earth at that point. I believe the second coming is at the end of the seven years of tribulation. So, the, just to be clear, you're, you're saying that that when he, the rapture comes, he'll be in, in, he'll come down, but he'll be not on earth, he'll be in the sky. Exactly, because we're caught up to And then we're going to be, be caught him. up to him in the sky, whereas when he... After the dead in Christ are raised. Right. 
and then when he returns in Revelation, he comes down to earth. Well, he returns both times in Revelation. But when he returns... But he's, he actually returns to earth no, at the was... end of the, the tribulation. The end of the seven years. But he's not catching people in the air. He's touching earth. Touching the earth. That's yeah. Which is supposed to be after people are caught up in the clouds with him? Yes. Right. Yes. So, in my opinion... The raptures at the beginning, I don't believe we go through the tribulation. A lot of people believe that the rapture occurs in the middle of the tribulation because the first three and a half years are not as drastic. And then after the abomination of desolation, which we'll talk about in a second, which is at the midpoint of the tribulation, then it gets really heavy. So, uh, we're going to go through that, personally. Um, that's my opinion. What, why don't you believe that? What leads you to believe that that we won't? I don't believe the Lord would have us go through that. Because we're his people. And the tribulations. Because we're already believers in Christ. And we're not his enemies. We're his... Yeah. Yeah. And there will be many who know but don't believe who will be left behind, if anybody remembers that series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole left behind, and a lot of people are left who know what the Word says, but never actually committed their lives to the Lord. And they're the ones who, as the tribulation goes on, they're the ones who will live through it, and many of them will come to Christ. Because now they see what happens. They see that all the people who are believers, all these good people, <coughs> are gone. Yeah. And they won't hear the trumpet, but we will, I believe. Right. When, when he comes and trumpet sound while he's in the clouds. I believe we hear it and we'll go. But I don't believe anybody who will be left hears that. Yeah, it's very, um, I mean, it's we can talk about it and, and, and know it intellectually, but it should motivate us to really pray for the laws, very, you know, pray for those who are lost, pray for our loved ones, reach out as we're able to with the gospel because, you know, we want people prepared so that when Christ does return, they are saved as much as, you know, as much as we could do anything about it. And of course, we're supposed to be watching and praying. We're supposed to, you know, ourselves stay, um, you know, there's a there's a crown for those who a crown that we're, are watching for the Lord's return, and so we're supposed to stay, you know, continually like daily reminding ourselves it could be today. Think of all the people who think this is all symbolic, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden one day, all these people are gone, just vanished. It's going to make them open their Bibles and. Mm -hmm. Have some second thoughts. And they still can get saved, but they most oh, likely right. will be martyred. Mm -hmm. Like with the guillotine or whatever. Yeah. But better that than go to hell. Which brings us to the tribulation. And uh, basically there's three points of view on that. One, which I've already said, I believe the rapture occurs before. And there might even be a little bit of time in between before the tribulation actually begins. Um, then there are those who believe it occurs during the tribulation, but before the great tribulation, which are the bold judgments. Those are the really bad ones. 
that occur in the last three and a half years. And when you read these things, and you see how extreme they are, you imagine seven years of this. You know, it's, it's not just going to happen and boom, be over. But these last. They're, they're, they are over time. And then there's those that are post-tribulation who believe that there is no rapture, but that we go with the, the rapture and second coming are the same thing. Which I believe having read 1 Thessalonians 4, I don't see how you could believe that, in my opinion. It's a, it's a separate event. Because how could you go up in the clouds if he's coming to earth? Mm -hmm. um, any comments? Thoughts? Then there's the millennium. So when all this stuff is said and done, Christ comes, they lock up Satan, and uh, there will be people still alive, and um, they will populate the earth, and uh, the millennium is a thousand year period, so imagine how many people could now repopulate the earth in a thousand years. And I believe, and I don't know if I can point to anything right now, but <clears throat> that the lifespan of people will be a thousand years. We won't die. Or those that are here won't die. I trust we'll be fine. But, <clears throat> and uh, Christ is ruling. Satan is bound. But people still have their human nature. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed for one last time. And people will have to choose. So there's still one more time people will make a choice. Um, so if, if you are a premillennialist, you believe that the millennium happens after the tribulation and everything. And there are people, they're called amillennialists. Again, they believe the thousand years is just symbolic. And uh, with the way Satan is today, I don't see how you could say it's symbolic because during the millennium Satan is bound mm -hmm. and will not actually be actively working on earth. Plus the lion lays down with the lamb. The child can put his hand in a, a, a poisonous spider and not get bit. The child will leave them. It's, it's a time of peace that we don't have right now. Right. And then there are those who are post-millennialists, and they believe that there's a thousand-year golden age of Christianity. And then at that point, Christ comes back. What do they mean, golden age of Christianity? What does that mean? Life without the devil. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. But, uh, but we all still, will be uh, good, and we're still sinners. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you read, if you read in Revelation, when it's talking about um, the millennial time, it talks about how Christ returns, and and it, it sounds like we return with him. Yeah, we and do. And then we rule and reign with him. So that kind of doesn't. I mean, if there's if there's not if Satan's not going to be here, then where does our temptation of sin come from? I didn't say I agree with this. <laughs> yeah, or understand it all. I'm just putting the theories out there. 
Well, he told me I had to talk, so. No, no, no. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so I'm talking. But the, there are people who believe these things. Yeah. I don't know how. That was my thought process on that. You know, and I think sometimes people just hear about things and they come up with a theory. And they don't actually read the scripture. They don't have a clue what's in the Bible. They just uh, mimic what they've heard. And these things evolve over to but Or they ignore what doesn't make sense to their theory. Or they bend it to right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. right. What's convenient yeah. for them. Right. 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 <clears throat> Like other sections of the Bible that people ignore, and mm. flip it to whatever news, they're... history, yeah. or anything, any yeah. other information. Yeah. In this world. Well, it is challenging. I mean, I don't think anybody would say the Book of Revelation is a piece yeah. of cake. No. no. So it's kind of a. I mean, that doesn't. That's not an excuse, but it's something you. I think you have to ch tackle it. You know, as a Christian, you should, at some point, anyway. Well, it does say. Uh, Blessed are those who hear it, take to heart what's written in it, because time is near. That's right. So I think too many people avoid it because it's scary, confusing, controversial, scary, whatever. <laughs> but when you avoid it, you're not going to get a blessing. So anyway, just a couple other things. The abomination of desolation. Um... That kind of marks the midpoint of the tribulation. And it's hard to say exactly what that is, but I believe that's when sacrifices to Satan occur in the temple. And at that point, everything goes downhill from there. And you have to go to Daniel and about that. Then there's the great white throne judgment. And there's, there's two judgments. One, we'll be judged as Christians and we'll receive our crowns and everything. And <clears throat> but then there's the great white throne judgment. And that's where everybody who has died now is brought before the throne. And uh, that's when the unbelievers are judged. And that's when there's a lot of screaming and gnashing of teeth as they go into the lake of fire to join Satan. Satan's already been thrown into the lake of fire at that point. So, and after the great white throne judgment, then it's heaven. Any thoughts, observations? <clears throat> Not an easy book to. No. no. Tried to give a little flavor of it, but as we go through, I'm sure a lot of other things will come up. Do you think that, you know, when the Lord takes us from this earth. That this this has always bothers me, you know, because I raised my children in the church and now they don't attend church and I do pray for them. But will we know when we're you know, on the other side of in heaven, are we gonna know whether or not our children have I mean She and I completely disagree on this. I believe you will. I believe we will. Yeah. I, 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 I can see myself getting very upset about this. <laughs> well, in heaven, there's no tears. Yeah. He wipes away every tear. Yeah. There's no sorrow. There's no sin. We're, uh, we have no sin nature. We're not going to be spending eternity grieving over somebody else's choice. And I agree with that, but it doesn't mean you don't know. Well, <clears throat> if we know, I don't know, maybe we'll see or something. Maybe he'll show us our life or bear him or whatever. But then... It, another place it talks about how this life's going to be like a distant memory, or like a faint. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be dwelling on, oh my goodness, all those anguish pains we suffer. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not. We're not going to have uh, coulda, woulda, shoulda. 
thoughts. Right. 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 So, Regret or yeah. Yeah. And like um, what Dr. James and Jeremiah said, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Then we're being saved from the power of sin as we, you know, surrender to the Spirit and become more and more Christ-like. And then in heaven, we're saved from the presence of sin. There's no sin, and it's perfect. It's like Adam. It's like Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. And we're not going to be worried. And everybody has to make a choice, and nobody can make that choice for anybody else. And but also, train your child when he's old. When he's old, he won't part from it. That's that. There's a lot of promises like. Um, 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 it's Isaiah 54, 13. All my children are taught of the Lord, and great is their peace. Um, he makes everything beautiful in his time. Believe me, I pray for my kids too. <laughs> he makes everything beautiful in his time. Um, so you can pray these promises, because out of the promises we partake in the divine nature. That's what it says. So we can pray these promises over our kids, and just we have to trust the Lord for them, because at this point they're adults, and you know, we, we did what we could. I know you trained them, and we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. We didn't no. look perfect. No. But if we had to be perfect, then God wouldn't have given them to us in the first place. So we have to trust them into God's care, and we just have to stand on the promises and obviously do what we can, but we really can't probably say much at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we can pray and just stand on the promises. Because mm -hmm. God's got to handle it. And, you know, it took us a while to get there, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. Oh, yeah. So anyway, this is this is just something you can stick in your Bible that conveniently will fit. Just a little outline. So as we go through. For those that have a Bible that has an outline, that's one thing, but a lot of people don't. So. Thank you, Dave. See, I was so excited, and I had something to be excited about. Yeah. You want to take these for um, your husband? Uh, well, I'll just share with him. Yes. Oh, you want to take the picture? No. Does she like her husband? We always like her. <laughs> I think maybe they'll be useful for people to come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, right. yeah I'm just going to leave yeah. the extra copies yeah. here. I also have PDFs so I can, if someone's watching and they want a copy, right. I can email them a PDF. So, anyway, that's kind of an overview. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure next week we will start with chapter one. And, uh, like I said, it'll be interesting to see how it compares when people start to, uh, I mean, it, I, w I went to some like that college, so the pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, that's what you're taught. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I've never seen anything to deter me from following that. I can understand how people have a difference. And I believe Pastor Ken is mid-tribulation. Yeah, I think I've heard of We have to put everybody it. in a pigeon hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it helps to understand where people are coming from if you know how they, yeah. Yeah, how they look at it. But, um, so anyway. Yeah. Any prayer requests? I'm going to the funeral tomorrow for my friend's oh. granddaughter who passed away of a massive heart attack at 37 years old oh, last goodness. Friday up in Vernon. Um, her granddaughter did not attend church. Um, my friend Martha, she's she's come here before, okay. um, and she goes to Calvary, um, so she is a Christian. And um, so prayers for Martha and for her family. She's... Uh, uh, tried to bring her adult children. Well, she has, actually, she has a son that's um, a chaplain and another son that teaches in a Christian college, but her, her daughter does not attend church. And this is her daughter's daughter. Okay. 
So, um, so prayers for, for that family time. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's a funeral? Yeah, tomorrow's a funeral. I'm going in Vernon. Praise your lead. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we thank you so much for this time, Lord, this place. Thank you for each one here, each one watching. Thank you for your love for all of us, God. Thank you that you truly know each of our names and you care for us. Uh, thank you that we can uh, just get a sense of what this book and what you want us to know and help us Lord we need your help to grasp it and to understand it and receive it uh, you gave it to us you want us to have it and we thank you that it's a blessing like it says certainly it shows us what the end of the world will be like so we kind of know what's coming up Father um, we pray for especially for Mary Claire uh, for this funeral tomorrow we ask that you go with her traveling and just be with his family, Lord, uh, with the shock of losing their, their daughter and granddaughter. And we just pray, um, you know, you would draw them to yourself, that you would put your arms around them and um, just draw them to yourself. Because um, you are the only answer in life, and for, especially in a situation like this, you, you're the one, you're the only answer. We thank you that you, uh, you're enough. I just love you so much. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, we can open your word and study it. And we just thank you for the word you've given us. <clears throat> and we just ask you to reveal your truth as we study Revelation and help us to know you better from our study and we ask for uh, travel mercies for Pastor Ken and Debbie as they return home and we ask uh, that you be at the center of our business meeting this Sunday and have your will done and we just praise you and thank you for all you do for us in your name we pray Amen. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. I'm going to bring it here off. Finish it off. Shut it down. You just hit finish? Oh, well, you can do it. I hate to say because I never know if it's exactly. Okay. Yeah, finish. I